Welcome to Gerald Ford Museum. Uh, my name is Jim Kratzis. I'm the deputy director, and I was told to move this a little bit. Um, our director, uh, Elaine Didier, could not be here tonight, and she gives her regrets in that regard. Earlier this month, the museum opened the exhibit Pro Football in the American Spirit, a traveling display from the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Much has been made of the fact that Major League Baseball players served in military during wartime. The names of Ted Williams, Warren Spahn, Stan Musial, and Hank Greenberg are just a few of the players that have been honored for serving. Yet those same laurels for pro football players have always taken a back seat to those from baseball. Pro football in the American spirit, though, documents the sacrifices of those players many of whom were wounded or paid the ultimate sacrifice for our country. Hall of Famers Art Donovan, Otto Graham, Norm Van Brocklin, and Chuck Bednarik were just a few of those who fought in World War II. 23 never came home. Players volunteered or were drafted into service during the Korean and Vietnam Wars, while others volunteered in the Gulf War and the Wars on Terror. We all know of Pat Tillman's sacrifice, turning his back on millions of dollars while playing for the Arizona Cardinals to volunteer. I invite all of you to ex uh, visit the exhibit tonight after our program and enjoy the refreshments in the lobby. The exhibit and tonight's speaker are made possible through the generous support of the Gerald Ford Foundation. And I want to thank our executive director, Joe Calvaruso, for, for that support. So thank you, Joe. <clears throat> okay, bear with me a little bit here. The 1970s was the best of times and the worst times for my hometown of Pittsburgh. It was suffering massive job losses as the economic backbone of the city, the steel industry, collapsed. It was bleak, but the city rallied around its sports teams. The Pirates, yes, that same team that may be the worst sports franchise in all of history, won two World Series that decade. And the Pittsburgh Steelers, one of the worst franchises up to that time, came out of nowhere to win four Super Bowls in six years. It was arguably the greatest football team ever assembled. Joe Green, Mike Webster, Jack Ham, Jack Lambert, Mel Blount, Franco Harris, Terry Bradshaw, under the leadership of Chuck Knoll and owner uh, Art Rooney, were just some of them who were inducted into the Hall of Fame. There was Franco's Italian Army, Jarella's Gorillas, the Immaculate Reception, and let's not forget the Terrible Towel. <laughs> no, Rocky, you can't have it. But there was only one rock, Rocky Blyer. To this day, when someone refers to Rocky in Pittsburgh, it's not about Rocky Balboa or Rocky Marciano. It's our speaker tonight. Rocky Blyer was born and raised in Appleton, Wisconsin, where he was a star in football and basketball. He was recruited by Notre Dame and was a member of the Fighting Irish's national championship team in 1966. He played along Terry Hanready, who would be his teammate again in a few years. 1968, Rocky was drafted twice, once by the Steelers and once by Uncle Sam after his rookie year. While serving in Vietnam, his platoon was ambushed. He was shot in the leg and then took shrapnel from a grenade. He received the Purple Heart and the Bronze Star. The doctors told him his football career was over. But that did not stop him. In 1970, the Steelers placed him on injured reserve. He worked his way onto the taxi squad the following year in 1971. In today's NFL, somebody with those injuries would be cut from the team but owner Art Rooney asked Chuck Knoll to keep him on the team. It, it was a good thing he did. 
because Blyer became a starter on the 1974 team and remained in the starting lineup for all four Super Bowl championships. In 1976, he and Franco Harris became the second pair of running backs in, the N in NFL history to rush for each rush, rush for more than 1,000 yards in a season. It is my great honor and privilege tonight to present to you Rocky Blyer. Thank you. Jim, thank you very much. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a deed, a pleasure to be able to be here, to spend some time with you, uh, and uh, to be here in Grand Rapids. I've had the opportunity to be here on other occasions uh, in the past, uh, uh, but to be here at the museum uh, and uh, uh, and more importantly, be a part of this exhibit that's here. You know, the important thing about the, well, I should say this, the exhibit and uh, uh, pro football and the, and the American spirit. How many, if I just may, um, um, are veterans here? Thank you very much for your service and for what you've done. Out of those veterans, uh, how many are my Vietnam brother? Welcome home, and thank you for that time. Now, how many are Steeler fans here? Uh, okay, thanks very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And if you're not, you are tonight, <laughs> you know? So I do appreciate that. You know, the thing about this exhibit, and I've seen it in the past, uh, and being here at the Gerald Ford Museum is that looking at the exhibit as you come here, the first thing it does is that it really brings back memories of those who have played and more importantly, the time uh, when they played. So if you go back at World War II and those who had given up, and not necessarily given up, but really served their country during a period of time in Korea, in Vietnam, um, and then thereafter. For there has been several that have served in Afghanistan, players, first Gulf of War, who have come back and played. But it's memories that are important. And ultimately out of the memories of what they create, of what they remind us, it's the stories that go with that period of time, whether they be the stories of the players themselves or the stories that you have of that time in your experience and how you viewed either the players or the game, the memories, the time that you served, or a relative or a parent that had given their time to this country. And so it's all about memories. But the unfortunate thing is that in a book I just recently read called River Horse, the author William Least Heat Moon wrote that our physical components change every seven years so that our brains continuously pass memories off onto a complete stranger who we have been who is just now a fellow ghostly traveler. If memory were total and complete, perhaps we would be one person from start to finish, but forgetfulness cuts us off from who we have been so that hourly we are reborn. Now I tell you that in context because of the fact that I am now in my seventh decade of creating memories. And although I may not be the same person I was 43 years ago when I was in the rice paddies in Vietnam, or 32 years ago when I last wore a uniform in the NFL. But the highlights of that period of time, obviously, are forever etched in my memory. Now, what I've come to learn, it's not that I have forgotten. 
Satan, but it's usually my audience that has forgotten <laughs> who I am and how I single-handedly won those four Super Bowls for the <laughs> Pittsburgh Steelers. <laughs> but it was a period of time, you know, that was a very great opportunity for me to be able to, uh, to play or to come back, much as Jim had talked about. Who knew that the 70s were going to be what the 70s were for that town, for that area, for the world of sports, and for ultimately Pirate and Steeler fans throughout that period. It was a certain opportunity. And ultimately, that's all we have, our opportunities, if you come to think about it. We live in a culture of opportunity, not necessarily a culture of entitlement. And that's based on the simple premise that as long as we have choices in what we do and what we become, then we are basically a free people. But with choice comes a responsibility. And that responsibility is one, to be informed, to know more about what has taken place in the past, those who have served, those who have played, be informed about the stories within our own families and our own history, and then secondly, have the courage to act on that information. So if we have choices, and here's my theme, then we basically have two choices. One is to be less than we're capable of being, to do less, to have less impact, or secondly, to be more, to be more involved within your community, within your family, within your heritage. So if we have choices, then basically we only have one choice, and that is to be the best that you can be, no matter what you may do. But it raises for me the question of why, as we look around the society, why is it that some people succeed in their endeavors when others seem to fail? Why in the world of sports do some teams win when others seem to lose? What then are those ingredients that allow us individually and collectively to reach that potential? Well, to answer that, question, I'd like to tell you a story, or briefly a story. Uh, that happens to be my story, but I'd like you to at least listen to it from the point of view that we all have a story, obviously, of how we got to where we are at this moment in life. Now, most of my life, and this is where I'm going to start, most of my life has been involved in the world of sports, football specifically. And even though it's been my life and my focus and my passion, I've also come to realize that I do share this world with some people who could care less <laughs> about what is happening in the world of football. And some of those people may be sitting right in this audience <laughs> this evening. But whether or not you like the game of football, you at least have to admit to yourself that that game has become part of the fabric of our lives. I mean, think about it. Now that the season is well underway, whether it be high school, college, or on the professional level, it is a game that is on television 24 hours a day. It's in our local papers, radio talk shows. It becomes the topic of conversation within our homes, within the workplace. Some of us have played the game, friends have played the game, our kids have played the game. And football is much like life, if I can make that analogy. And why is that? Well, if you think about it, whether it be a game or whether it be a season, there is what? There is a beginning, there is a middle, there is an end. There's birth, there's life, there's death. And depending on how your team has performed, there's a mourning period. And then there's a renewal. And ultimately, we repeat that process week after week in the season after season. And it creates one word football does, much like life. And that one word is hope. God, I hope they can get it together this coming week. Oh, God, I hope they can win. I hope nobody gets hurt. I hope my kids have a great experience. Oh, I hope that we can get to the playoffs. Oh, I hope we can get to the championship game. Oh, I hope we get invited to a bowl. God, I hope we get to the Super Bowl. And even if your team, in all honesty, doesn't get to the Super Bowl, you hope the team you like the least beats the team you hate the most. <laughs> <laughs> I 
And the whole premise is that our lives are all built on, on hope, no matter what we may do. And that's really the one business that we are in. We're in the hope business, whether it be working, raising a family, whether it be teaching in our communities. We hope, hope that things change. We hope that things get better. We hope our kids have a great education. We hope they have a great experience. We hope, we hope, we hope. But as we well know, I mean, wishing, wanting, hoping are enough to succeed. We really need to have a plan to be able to get there. Because no man is an island. I mean, if you think about it, we didn't get to where we are today by ourselves. Ultimately, we got here because of someone, something, an opportunity, an open door. We got here because of a parent, a mentor, a teacher, a coach, a drill sergeant. Somebody that pushed you through the door, kicked you in the rear end. And my life was built on hope, and I have to tell you that in all honesty, as all of ours. But that one kernel, that one kernel of belief, that one kernel of hope has to start somewhere. And mine, I have to tell you in all honesty, started with the greatest football game I ever had the opportunity to play in. I was nine years old. <laughs> I was playing Dickie Weisgerber, my next door neighbor. Now being born and raised in a small Midwestern town, Appleton, Wisconsin, for us cheeseheads, football was a big part of our lives. And Dickie and I had an extensive schedule. We had home and away games. Now, this particular Saturday afternoon happened to be an away game for me, so of course I had to go across the street, <laughs> pick up Dickie, and play in his side lawn. But let me tell you, let me tell you, what a game. I scored 51 touchdowns <laughs> that afternoon. Thank you very much. I gained a little over 500 yards rushing. More importantly, I shut him out. Oh, the sucker didn't score. Oh, and I knew I had his number. Now, just because the fact Dickie was five shouldn't <laughs> take anything away from my personal achievement. You didn't know Dickie. He was a big five. He was a big kid. He was tough. As I had said, I grew up across the street from Dickie. And I grew up in a bar. Dad owned. Neighborhood. Shot in a beer joint. Blyers. We lived above it and met a lot of great people that walked through those doors, that sat on those stools across from my father. But I also met a lot of would-haves and could-haves and should-haves in our lives, as we all have, especially at the bar. Oh, you know, Rock, <laughs> I could have played, but, you know, I blew my knee out in second grade, and, you know, just, he just never responded. Or I should have played, or would have played. And there's always reasons why, as I've come to learn, as we've all come to learn, there's, that sometimes those childhood dreams didn't come to fruition. But hopefully what we've done has been able to learn from those experiences and use them as a stepping stone to propel us in a new and different direction. And I tell you that because of the fact that Dickie, because Dickie was not a would've, could've, should've guy. As we talked about it over the years, as we competed, his one dream, his one dream was that one day he was going to beat me. And he never gave that up. Now, it was my responsibility not to allow that to happen. And so we continued to play. And then ultimately, what I'd come to learn was that the impact of people within your life and the difference that they made, for all of a sudden, it was one person, a specific, a coach, who took a group of young men and molded them into a team. And because of the success of the team in his direction, you get recognized for your contribution. And because you get recognized, then all of a sudden you have another opportunity that may present itself. And for me, I got the chance and the opportunity to continue my education. And I got a scholarship to go to the University of Notre Dame. Now, it wasn't an easy choice, and I just have to put it in perspective for you, not because it wasn't a great school. Well, it was a period of time where my folks did not go to college. There was no allegiance of one university over another. I did feel a responsibility of maybe taking a look at the University of Wisconsin, because that was my home state. Had a family friend who 
put a bug in our ear about maybe Boston College. And so I went to the University of Notre Dame first and met Eric Persegian for the first time. A lot of perceptions had taken place. Now, one of the things Dickie and I had in common was a preconceived idea about being too small, too short, too slow, and not big enough to be able to play this game. Now, I was bigger than Dickie, but I wasn't bigger than the other guys. And so I went to the University of Notre Dame that first recruiting trip. Era had just come in, come in kind of late that year. So he didn't really have a whole lot of time to get a grip and a grasp of his new recruits. And the best that he could do was to go through the files that had accumulated over the last several months. And he was going through the files, starting with the A's, working his way down to the B's. All of a sudden, he did come to one Rocky Blyer. And he started to read it. And the more he read, the bigger his eyes became. Because he couldn't believe his good fortune. <laughs> Where you see, according to this file, he was getting a kid that was a high school All-American. Two-time All-State, three-time All-Conference. Gained 4,856 yards in his career, scored 89 touchdowns, had a 12-yard per carry average, punted, kicked off, return punts, return kicked off. He said, it's the second coming. I mean, with a kid like this, I'm going to be able to turn this program around in no time flat. I'm going to bring Notre Dame football back to the forefront. Well, unfortunately, reality set in for him when we met for the first time. And from his perspective, that meeting went something like this. <laughs> now, the leprechaun tryouts are over in the other building. Maybe you, he said, you're not. Oh, I am. Oh, don't tell me that. Why not? He said, because of the fact, look at you. <laughs> he said, you're not the same person. You're not big enough. You're not fast enough. You'll never be able to compete on this level. A preconceived idea. But I like the university. He offered me a scholarship, but I still had to go take a look at other universities. So I went to the University of Wisconsin, always too big for me. Went out to Boston College, love Boston. I'm a Rube out of Wisconsin. I'm in Boston. This is where it all started. Oh, it was terrific. I'd never been out of the state of Wisconsin before. This was great. Oh, and I came back home. Now I had to make a decision where to go. And I did what every good Catholic boy was taught to do. I went to church and I prayed for guidance and direction. And then, did, and then I did what my Irish mother wanted me to do, and that was go to Notre Dame. And so I ended up at <laughs> Notre Dame. But all of a sudden, because of a decision of a choice, of a path that one took, one individual, molded together a group of individuals into a team. And because of the success of that team, we won a national championship my junior year and I became captain my senior year. And because of that success, you get recognized for your contribution. And I get drafted by the Pittsburgh Steelers. Now maybe you have to understand, see, um, maybe their perception was closer to reality <laughs> when they selected I was not their first round pick. I did not make their top 10 list. I was the 417th person picked in the draft that year. I was a 16th round draft choice. But you have to understand, from my point of view, there were 17 rounds. Hey, at least I'm not the last guy picked. <laughs> I might have a chance to be able to make this team. And people said, well, how'd you make the team back then? You remember who played for the Steelers in the 60s? That's how come I made the team, because nobody can remember who played for the team during that period of time. And I got a chance to play 11 of 14 games that season. As a matter of fact, we're getting ready for our 12th game. And it was a Wednesday. I was in my locker, getting changed before we went to our first meeting, when all of a sudden one of my teammates hollered, Hey, Blyer! 
there's a piece of mail over here for you. Now, I have to tell you, it hasn't changed over the years. In every NFL locker room, even to this day, someplace there is a table where all the fan mail is deposited for the players. Now, it was a place I had never stopped at from that first day of training camp up through that 11th game. Why? Not when you're the 417th person picked playing on a losing team. Nobody knows you exist. My mother never even sent me a letter. <laughs> but all of a sudden, here it was, my first letter. I couldn't believe it. Magically, as it may seem, or at least to me, that table appeared across the room right in front of me. And I was standing there. And I looked down, and I saw the envelope. And I saw my name. And it was printed. It was almost pulsating. Rocky Blyer, Rocky Blyer, Rocky Blyer, Rocky Blyer. And I picked it up, and I opened it up. And I pulled out the sheet of paper inside and unfolded it, and it said, greetings. <laughs> We'd like to inform you that you've been inducted into the armed services of our country. And it was my draft notification. And within 48 hours, I was on my way to basic training, advanced infantry training. Flew home, said hi, goodbye, found myself in San Francisco, boarding a plane, flew over the Pacific. Oh, and landed in South Vietnam. A lot of perceptions, as we well know, for those of us who fought through that period of time and lived not only on the home front, but on the war front. Stop the war, bring the boys home. No, allow us to fight and allow us to win. And ultimately, my reality hit home on August 20th of that year. We were on patrol. Now, the mission was this. One of my fellow soldiers, Jim Wheeler, he and I, was sitting back in the back, he and I fought in the same company. He was in 2nd platoon, I was in 1st platoon. So we were just reminiscing about that period of time. Sister company had been hit, and we were flown out of one of our LZs, ultimately to pull front and rear security to get them out. And as we were moving them out late that night, we ran into an ambush, and the word was to leave what bodies we were carrying, and we'll come back to retrieve those bodies later on. Two days later, reinforced platoon. It was about 8 o'clock in the morning. We've been humping the hills since the break of dawn. Temperature was rising about 102, 103 degrees. Humidity was about 86 percent. Sweat was coming off our body. It was a welcome relief. We finally found our location when our commanding officer told us to saddle up. We're moving out of this little wooded area onto an open rice paddy. Word was to keep five yards distance between one another, keep your eyes and your ears open and your head on the swivel because, hey, the enemy, they're around. And when I, take, when I took a step out of that wooded area onto that open rice paddy, all of a sudden, our point man, who is now maybe 40 yards in front of me, all of a sudden hollered, gook, gook, and shots broke the stillness. And he started to race down the middle of that rice paddy, pulling everybody out into the middle when all of a sudden a machine gun started to level the area. Bodies were diving left and right into the rice paddies, trying to get out of the way of that machine gun. Everybody went to the right. I went to the left. Mistake. But anyway, crawling my hands and knees to the end of that rice paddy, found another one lying below us. Four guys were pinned down. Saw the machine gun nestled in the bushes about 75, 100 meters uh, away from me. Now, it was my responsibility to get firepower on that position, carrying a grenade launcher as I was. I rolled over my side, breached that grenade, when all of a sudden I felt the thud in my left leg. It started to burn and bled. And I was hit for the first time that day. Now, I discharged my round, dropped back behind some protection, got enough firepower on that medic, or not on, not on that medic, on that position, when the four guys were pinned down, they got out of there. And the fight took place off to the right. Now I'm lying in the field. And all of a sudden, my thought, and my first thought, was, 
my seventh grade teacher, Sister Hilaire, popped in my mind. And what she talked about, and what I remember, was in class, and she would talk about those soldiers that fought in World War II and in Korea, who at that moment in time found themselves in the foxhole. And how do you get yourself out of that position when things don't seem bright? Now we all have those foxholes in our lives every now and then, but here was the reality of that foxhole. Now one of the questions that is asked of me as time has gone by, oh, usually late at night after a meeting, after a talk, over a libation, when you're just one-on-one. -on -one. And that one burning question of what is it like to be in combat? For you see, for the majority of people, there's no reference point. One to two percent of our population serves in the military. Out of that percentage, 10% find themselves actually in combat. So what's the reference point? And we all want to know, what would I do at that moment in time, given that situation? We have reference points for everything else. We can play sports in the backyard. We can play football. We can play baseball. We understand what that is. We may never make it to the professional level, but what is it at that moment in time? Well, as I thought about that question, my response was, obviously, those who ask me that question never had a Catholic education. Because to put things in perspective, eight years of Notre Dame nuns, four years of Christian brothers, four years of Holy Cross priests, I know what combat, before I even got there, was all about. For those who have gone through that experience, let me tell you what. There is no drill sergeant tougher, no opponent tougher than a sister with a ruler in her hand and righteousness in her eyes. <laughs> but I think about that experience only because of the fact that ultimately living through that period of time made me who I am today, you know, because it was manners, yes sister, no sister, you know, which was Yes, mom, no mom. Yes, dad, no dad. Yes, father, no father. Then it became yes, coach, no coach. Yes, sergeant, no sergeant. Yes, dear, no dear. <laughs> I learned it well. But they taught you to pray throughout that experience because you did. You'd pray for no homework, you'd pray for days off, you'd pray for snow days, you'd pray for rain days, you'd pray for the fact that you could win the game. You prayed that the little blonde liked you. You prayed that you wouldn't get beat. You prayed that mom would never find out. You prayed that someday in war you'd come home safely. But then you've got to be worried of what you pray for because it may come true. And unfortunately, our young troops today know that. You know, the mortality rate in World War II was 50%. You got wounded, you had a 50-50 chance of making it. Vietnam became 33 and a third percent, a little bit better. Today, that young soldier today, if he is hit within an hour, and if he's gotten to within an hour, he's got a 98% chance of living, of surviving. But ultimately, he has to live then with the injuries that he sustained, the PTS that develops, TBI that is in existence. We have 300,000 young soldiers that are suffering from PTS. When we get out of Iraq and close the military down, there will be a million more coming back in the streets, living with an understanding 
what they have to live with. And we go home, but they have to live with it. And so here I was, in the rice paddy, finding myself in that foxhole that Sister Hilaire had talked about all those many years ago. These young men, who all of a sudden found themselves in a foxhole, would dedicate themselves and said, Lord, if you get me out of here, if you get me out of here, I'll become a priest. <laughs> you get me out of here, I'll build you a great hospital. The stories were in my mind, and here I was in that same circumstance. And I go, oh, well, I guess it's my time, you know? I mean, your back's against the wall, and you go, Lord, okay, if you get me out of here, I'll become a... If you get me out of here, I'll become a... All right, the word priest got stuck. I mean, I just, I couldn't make that commitment. And all of a sudden, I said, okay, fine, if you get me out of here, I'll build you a... I'll build you a... And the word hospital got stuck. Because ultimately, I think as I was standing there and laying in that rice paddy, I was thinking, ah, the reality of life brought me back to playing hide-and-go-seek when I was a kid. And when you couldn't find that one last person, you'd go, Ali Ali in free, you know, we got a free ride coming in, nobody cares, you know. And I thought, well, you know, ultimately, I get out of this situation. It might be Ali Ali in free. I mean, I knew myself well enough that, you know, I really didn't mean <laughs> I wanted to become a priest. I think maybe you heard me wrong. I just, you know, I, let's, let's compromise on this. And so ultimately, ultimately, you do this. And I go, okay, fine. What you have is my life. I'll share the good times and I won't complain about the bad times. That's the only deal I can make. And maybe it's the only deal that we can make within our lives of sharing them with our families, sharing them with one another, and giving of our time within our communities. That's all we really have. Medic came over. We got out of there. We crawled back to our commanding officer. We set up another defensive position. When all of a sudden, the enemy had Got close enough to our perimeter, I saw a grenade come flying through the air and hit my commanding officer on the back and it bounded off towards where I was. In a matter of seconds, I had to decide which way to jump. As I got up, it blew up. Oh, it blew up through my right foot, right knee, and right thigh. And I was hit for the second time. And as I was thinking about it, and I thought, yeah, you know, he just wants to make sure that I'm committed to what I already committed to before. <laughs> just, I know he was testing me at that time. And so we're in a firefight until a platoon fought its way down and dragged us out of there. Some six hours later, we did get to a security area. Helicopters came in, took us to an aid station, took us to the Nang where we got patched up. And then they flew to Tokyo where I spent three weeks in the hospital before I came back to the States where I spent nine months in the hospital and went through three more operations. But it was during that period of time when I was in, to when I was in Da Nang, just out of the field, as Ed made mention, IVs running out on my body, morphine drip to take the pain away, all those questions that we have, when we do have them, of why me, now what, where am I gonna go? I had something, you took it away from me, where, 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 where's my future? Come rushing through my head. And across from me was a young soldier, who was a triple amputee. Lost his left arm and both legs. And every day, or at least while I was there, every day, the aides would come and they'd, 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 they'd help him get out of the bed. And he'd grab the little trapeze and he'd swing his torso into a wheelchair and they'd push him out on his way to therapy. And he, he'd stop at each bed and, I, and he'd stop at my bed. And it wasn't a big ward. And he'd go, hey, how you doing today? You know, you look better today than, than you did yesterday. Because let me tell you this, yesterday, phew, you look like crap. <laughs> and we got some good docs here. They're going to take care of you, and uh, you know they'll get you out of here, and I'll see you back in the real world one of these days. And I thought, wow, if anybody could be embittered with their lot in life, it would be that young soldier. Having lived with the atrocities that took place thousands of miles away, but yet he chose to make a difference. Yet he chose to have a positive attitude. And I thought, wow, I mean, if he can have an attitude like, what about me? I'm going to walk someday. I'm going to get out of here. And I went to Tokyo, as I'd made mention. And I built up a pretty good rapport with my physician, um, but that burning desire, that question that we have of, you know, about the future, what do you think? What do you think? Doc, do you think I can come back and play? Now his response was something like this. <laughs> oh, 
worry. He said, you're going to have a normal life. You're going to be able to do the things that normal people do. Just don't expect to get back in the gridiron. He said, because of the fact you just won't have the strength nor the flexibility to do the things that are necessary to be running back in the NFL. For you see what he had formulated from his point of view, from his stream of information, correct or not in his diagnosis, obviously was a perception about my ability. And as my authority figure, he just sucked that hope right out. Two days later, I got a postcard in the mail, a simple postcard. It had two lines on it, it said this, Rock, team's not doing well, we need you. Art Rooney, owner of the team. Wow, somebody needed me. Not that they needed me, somebody had an interest. Somebody took the time to write me a postcard and said, hey, we want you. Now, whether they needed me or not, as I had been mentioned, wasn't the case. Being the family that they are, I came back and they bought me a year. I tried to make the team, couldn't do it too fast, and they put me on injured reserve. And I had another operation. Came back the following year. A little bit bigger, a little bit stronger. Made the taxi squad that year, now called the developmental squad. One step up over into reserve. Suited up for the last three games, didn't play, just sat on the bench, but hey, better than the year before. But what they bought was two years of opportunity, two years to get stronger, bigger, faster. So I came back in 1972. Leading ground gainer during the exhibition season. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good enough to make the team. Never carried the ball, just played special teams, but it was better than the year before, an opportunity that existed. And then all of a sudden, 1972 became a magical year. For 40 years, it was a team destined to lose. For 40 years, it was always the same old Steelers wait till next year. 40 years, and we won the division that year, and we got into the playoffs. And it was during the playoffs against the Oakland Raiders, that first game, that'll boil down to one play that changes the course and direction of that team. That play goes down to the annals as one of the all-time great comebacks affectionately known in Steeler history as the Immaculate Reception 40 years ago, this coming December 23rd. Toughly fought battle. We had the lead six to nothing. Within the last minute, we allowed the Raiders to move the ball down the field. It was third in a long situation when Kenny Stabler, their quarterback, dropped back, looking downfield, fulfilling his responsibility, trying to get a first down, get his team into a position to score. Now, we weren't going to allow that to happen. Why? Because we worked too hard to get there. We had everybody covered. Double team was necessary. When all of a sudden, as he dropped back, the middle of their, our defense opened up. And he had the audacity to tuck that ball underneath his arm. And we weren't worried about him because in the pregame preview, you know, he's not a runner. He was not a runner. He was more classified as a loper, one of slow movement. <laughs> and so all of a sudden, the middle of our defense opened up. And he tucked that ball underneath his arm and he started to lope up through the middle of that defense. We were on the sidelines, started to yell and scream as the fans in the stands for the defense to respond. By the time they responded, he got down to the five yard line. But by the time anybody got there, he dove into the end zone to score, to tie the game and with that extra point to take the lead. And we're stunned in silence because in everybody's mind, it was like, oh God, the same old Steelers. <sighs> Can't win the big game. Wait till next year. Hopefully something new changes. On the ensuing kickoff, we get the ball back on our 40-yard line. Three incomplete passes by our illustrious quarterback, Mr. Bradshaw. Now left just with fourth down and 60 yards to go. For a score to get us in the position to win. When he dropped back, looking downfield, trying to find an open receiver. When all of a sudden the defensive line poured through our offensive line, they broke down, putting pressure on Bradshaw, and he started to scramble to his right. And in the last second before he gets hit, he looks down and he sees a receiver, Frenchy Fuqua, who's maybe 25 yards downfield, and he's going down and he releases the ball and being the great athlete that he is, the ball comes out hard, fast, and furious. 28 seconds left on the clock. Frenchy is waiting for it. 
And all of a sudden, Jack Tatum, the defensive back for the Oakland Raiders, was coaches. All defensive backs are coaches. When the ball is thrown, what? Get over there. Knock it down, intercept it. If you can, at least make the tackle so they can't advance the ball. Tatum's on his high horse. The ball's coming. Frenchie's waiting. It's a ball. Tatum and Frenchie. When the inevitable happens, and they all arrive at the same place at the same time. And the ball careens up in the air on its way down to hit the turf to end the game to let the Raiders win when out of the backfield. The rookie sensation from Penn State, Franco Harris, scoops that ball off of his shoestrings and before anybody can react, he crushes the 50, down to the 45, 35, 25, gets hit, stays in bounds, goes to the end zone, God, he scores, the place erupts. 58,000 fans yelling, screaming, stomping their feet. We, who are his teammates, go running down that sideline to find him standing all alone in that end zone, and we do what everybody has done from the beginning of time and will into eternity. We jump on top of him. <laughs> and then more on top of them and more on top of them. And it was a buy-in for my fellow, fellow, fellow teammates for the work and dedication and commitment they made. And hope was in the air for the future. And we came back, 1973, and I have to tell you this, oh, a little bit bigger in my case, a little bit stronger, with new, renewed enthusiasm. Leading ground gainer, once again, during the exhibition season. <laughs> Thank you very much. Got to carry the ball once during that season. Hey, better than the year before. But all of a sudden, things started to change for me, and I have to tell you this, and all honesty, just to put things in the right perspective, for in 1973, as I was playing special teams again, looking at the future, what's going to happen, I formed a preconceived idea about what the future was going to be. That the starting running backs were already predetermined for the coming year. The backups were already predetermined for the coming year. For me to make the team, once again, I was going to have to fight with every free agent draft choice and rookie just to make the team. Oh, and I didn't think it was fair, not that you didn't have to work for a position. What I didn't think was fair was that the starting running back who was going to be given the job the coming year was on injured reserve in 1973. He wasn't the leading ground gainer during the exhibition season. He never even carried the ball once, but he was going to be given the job on potential. And I didn't think it was fair. At the end of the season, I left the team. I didn't quit. You understand that? You understand that? I did not quit. Why? Because we are not taught to quit. Did your, did your dad teach you to quit? Huh? Did your coach teach you to quit? Your teachers teach you to quit? Our society doesn't teach you to quit. No, we're not taught to quit. We're taught to repress. <laughs> we're good at that. We're taught to overanalyze. Well, we're taught to think. Well, what's happening here? Jeez, I don't know. Well, what does it mean? I don't know what it means. Are you going to get a shot next year? Well, I don't know. You know, I mean, they're, you know, I'm not part of that group. I, I don't think so. You know, I mean, I did come back, as I said. I got my five years in. I got a chance to play. I got a chance to carry the ball, even though it was once. So my dreams and my visions were there. Maybe not to the extent that I wanted to, but I can't say that it didn't happen. So then you go, oh, maybe it's a sign. Why? Because we're big on signs, aren't we? Oh, maybe it's a sign, yes. Maybe my life's going in this direction. Over here, you know? And so one of the things I come to learn is make sure you read the fine print of any contract you sign. In the NFL, it's implied most of the time that sometime in your career, you must sell life insurance. So I was uh, fulfilling that part of my obligation. I was living in Chicago and um, I got a call from a teammate of mine who's coming to Chicago. Big sports dinner, Boys and Girls Club of Chicago, sponsored by the NFL. Guys are coming from all over the league. He said, why don't you join us? Hadn't seen you since the end of the season. It'd be great to see you, catch up with you. Well, I'm, I'm not going back. I disassociated myself. I declined very politely, because that's how I was raised. Well, he asked again, I declined again. He asked some more, I declined some more. He pushed. I push back. He asked a little harder and I declined a little harder. Then he asked me that question, why? God, I really hadn't come to that realization or reasons why. And the only thing I blurred out was, well, I quit. I'm not going back. He said, you can't quit. He said, if you quit, what you've already done is that you've already made a decision for the coaching staff. He said, now, if you like them well enough to make decisions for them, 
He said, no, that's not your responsibility. Your responsibility is that you come back and you make them make a decision. You back them in the corner. You give them every reason to either keep you or release you, but you don't cut yourself. I mean, the reality of this game, like life, is that we're all expendable. The reality of this game is we all can be cut at any time, but if this is what you want, then you don't cut yourself. Oh, maybe it was just the arm twisting I needed. And I went back and everything that I had perceived, oh, it did take place. And I had a fight with every free agent, draft choice, and rookie once again to be able to make the team. Leading ground gainer during the exhibition season. Thank you very much. Now, I tell you that in context only because one of the things that we love to do, we love to do, I don't care what we do, what we love to do is that we love to project our successes. We love to extrapolate our successes. We do it with our, with our teams. Oh, God, they really got off to a great start. Boy, if they can continue to play, hey, they can win the division, or they can win their conference, or they can get in the playoffs. Oh, boy, yeah, my kid might get a chance to start. I mean, he did play well, and so he's going, oh, yeah, well, we love to do that. We love to do that. Well, all of a sudden, Dom, the reason, you know, so I'm thinking to myself, I don't understand. Three years, I'm leading ground gainer. Obviously, I can carry the ball. I don't know why I don't during the regular season, you know, just give me a chance. Give me an opportunity. You know, give me the ball eight, nine hundred times. I mean, I'll get you a thousand yards. I mean, that's not that difficult to be able to do. When it finally dawned on me that the reason that I was a leading ground gainer wasn't because I was bigger, faster, or better than any of the other running backs was the simple fact that I played more than anybody else during that period of time. I carried the ball more than anybody else during that period of time. I better be the leading ground gainer because all they were providing for me was an opportunity to be able to make this team. And so they had to keep me. And as I tell people that season in 1974, I was the fifth running back out of four, playing special teams again. When all of a sudden that first game, unbeknownst to us, Franco Harris, our starting fullback, gets hurt. The backup becomes the starter. I become the backup to the backup. Wow, I had not been there before in those years previously. All of a sudden, I just got a little renewed vigor. First game, second game, third game, fourth game, right before the half, the backup gets hurt. I'm inserted the game at fullback along with my running mate, a guy by the name of Preston Pearson, who finished his career with the Dallas Cowboys. And I tell you this only because he breaks one 43 yards down the sideline, and he scores, and we go into halftime with a lead. We go over assignments adjustments at halftime, and I'm thinking to myself, who's going to start the second half? Maybe those guys that got you the lead in the first half. So we get to start the second half, Preston and I, and as a team, we win that game. So everybody's still kind of banged up. We get to start the week thereafter. And we win that game. And the week after that, it's a Monday night game, an extra day of healing. Franco now becomes healthy. Damn. <laughs> but that's okay. At least I got a chance to play, show, prove what I could do. And we had our pregame meal, as they do. And we have our little breakout group. All the running backs get together. We go over last minute assignments, adjustments. Coach gives us the first three plays of the game, just in case Bradshaw should forget. So we can remind him of what they are. And he looks around the table and he says, Franco, you and Rock will start tonight. Momentarily, I was quite confused. I didn't know how we both could play the same position at the same time. When it finally dawned on me that I wasn't going to play the fullback position as I had been playing, I was going to play the other running back position. Now, what confused me was that Nobody told me that. I wish they would have. I'd been better prepared, but we get to start that game, and as a team, oh, we win that game. So we get to start the following week, and we win that game. And we start the remaining part of that season, Bradshaw and Franco and myself, and we win the division, and we get into the playoffs, and we win the playoffs, and we go to the Super Bowl for the first time, and we win the Super Bowl, and we play six more years together, we play three more Super Bowls. And in 1976, Franco and I become the second set of running backs in the history of the NFL, each to gain 1,000 yards rushing in one season. And after 12 years, I retire. Now, I tell you this story in context to some degree. Because of the fact that no matter how hard we work, determined that we may be, how passionate we are about what we do, 
how focused we are sometimes. There are times in our lives when we carry the weight of the world on our shoulders. There are times in our life when we beat our head against the wall. There are times in our life when the grass looks greener than the other side. There are times in our lives when we want to quit, give up, move on. Well, I suppose the moral of this whole story is that if I would have quit all those many years ago, never had the opportunity to play those 12 years, play in those four Super Bowls, or have all those memories. But the reason I got a chance to play wasn't because of my size and speed, two things I do not possess, but ultimately because of one talent. For one of the things that we have to understand, especially the young people, that we all possess a talent of one nature. And it's our responsibility to define that talent that we bring to not only ourselves, our communities, our families, our workplace. We have strengths and we have weaknesses, but we also have a talent. For all those many years ago, prior to that breakout group, Chuck Knoll, our offense, I mean our head coach, stopped our backfield coach and said, listen, you got a weakness in your backfield. Who is your best blocker? He said, wire. He said, then start him. One talent. And all of a sudden, that fine line of one that connected my life came full circle. Much like the fine line of one that connects each and every one of our lives to where we are at this moment in time. For you see, if it wasn't for that one talent or recognition of that one talent, I might not have had that opportunity to start that game. But then I got to thinking, well, if it wasn't for the one injury, <laughs> I might not have had a chance to play. <laughs> or if it wasn't for Preston's one touchdown, I might never have played that second half. Or if it wasn't for that one phone call, I might never come back. Or the one postcard, one triple amputee, one terrific game against Dickie Weisgerber. <laughs> it may never have happened at all. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the power that we have, the power to change, the power to influence, the power to make a difference, the power to tell the stories about the American spirit and what it means to us, to our kids, our families, to be involved in our community. Because as William Jennings Bryan said, destiny is not a matter of chance, it's a matter of choice. It's not a thing to be waited for, but it's a thing to be achieved. And each and every one of our destinies lies right here in our own hands. We can become what we want to become. So in closing, I'd like to leave you the few words that have been with me for many, many years. And they go like this. If you think you are beaten, you are. If you think you cannot, oh, you don't. If you like to win, think you can't. It's almost a cinch you won't. Life's battles won't always go to the stronger or faster man, but sooner or later, the one who wins is the one who thinks he can. And you're all winners out there. God bless. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's kind of it. Thank you. <laughs> Sit down, Jim. Just uh, we got to, We'll have a couple. We can have a couple questions, can't we? One of the things I forgot to ask. We're gonna, we're gonna open it up to some question and answers. You know, for those who have to leave, you know, please don't hesitate to do so. Um, and you're so kind to. You're so kind to sit in those seats for as long as I move my gums here. Um, so, are there? Um, I should tell you one thing, you know, in one of the, one of the little stories I, I, I made mention, I forgot. Oh, actually this, I should, <laughs> well, I'll leave it. Anyway, <laughs> it's, it's, I, I usually start out in question and answers in this regard. Anybody have any, anybody have any questions? Usually nobody does. Oh, they don't because everybody's very bashful. Somehow, and I tell you this in all, somehow here we are as mature, responsible adults that when an outsider like this, ladies and gentlemen, do you have any questions? Somehow, in mass, mentally, we revert to being in the third grade. I mean, think about it, it could have been second, third, fourth. We had that one experience in class. I did, I was in the third grade. I was sitting in the back of the classroom and the teacher said, well, boys and girls, are there any questions? And I had a question, but I knew if I raised my hand, she would call on me and I'd ask the question. And she would say, well, Robert, that's my name. That's a stupid question. You should know the answer to that. <laughs> and all the kids would laugh at me. And that's what happens because 
when we're finished and nobody asks a question, some one of you, as we walk out of here and we talk, will come up to me and say, I was too embarrassed. <laughs> what do you think about this? What do you think about the Steelers? What do you think about Notre Dame? You do that, I'll break your leg. So we have a little deal. <laughs> I just, I say, we haven't got to catch me yet. Anyway, I should, I, one of the stories I wanted to tell, one of the stories, here, Super Bowl rings. You know, it was very fortunate for the time. Playing there, we, <laughs> Super Bowls, I forgot to tell the story. Super Bowls, um, so playing with that team. Super Bowls nine in 10, here they are, 13 in uh, 14. Do, 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 do you know how many Steeler fans it takes to change the light bulb? So, the answer is five. It's one, or two. <laughs> one to change the light bulb, the other four to talk about how great the 70s were. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so 74 and 75, just to refresh your memory, 74, 75, 78, 79, one against the Minnesota Vikings, two against the Dallas Cowboys, and the fourth against the then LA Rams. But you also have to understand that having four Super Bowl rings, and I tell you this, it poses a lot of problems to me. Because no matter where I go, it raises a myriad of questions. <sighs> Much like I got from Jim. From, from Jim, I honestly got it. In back, right before. Because I didn't have him, at, we had lunch, but I, I didn't have him right back here. And he, and he goes, you know how excited he was about the 70s. And he goes, oh, geez, Rock. I mean, you got four Super Bowl rings. Do you, do you, do you, do you? change them every day? I mean, how do you decide which one to wear? I mean, which one's better than the other one? Which one do you like more than the other one? Well, I have to tell you in all honesty that this one that I wear on my right hand from Super Bowl 13, the second time that we had played the Dallas Cowboys, is the one that I wear all the time. Primarily, a lot of reasons why. The primary reason is because it happens to be the largest and gaudiest of all four of them. So, <laughs> just put that into perspective. Anyway, there we go. Question. Art Rooney, uh, Mr. Rooney owned the team. And for those who have never had that experience of uh, being in Pittsburgh or being Ron, Art uh, was a uh, you know was a wonderful owner, uh, and ultimately. The, you know, put his imprimatur on that team and how it is run and how the family has run that team and so on. Art uh, grew up on the north side in, in Pittsburgh. He bought the team for $2,500 uh, in 1933. Uh, it moved a fledgling NFL franchise into Pittsburgh and moved the north side San Love football team uh, in, in, into the league. As we were saying, for 40 years, it was a team destined to lose. But Art always, you know, Art just, Art never took a salary from the team. I think the first time that he had ever been paid from the team was in 1969 that he had taken a salary. Art was a um, gambler and he uh, uh, was a very successful gambler. Uh, played the horses, uh, uh, and so if you ever ever talked to him, he, he had wonderful stories. I mean, he had wonderful stories about just that. You know, he was not afraid to bet. He was not afraid to bet to win. He was a great handicapper at that time. Coming in, uh, you know, early bets uh, were solid. Uh, you know, there's no mutuals, um, no trifectas, none of that. Uh, so whatever the uh, whatever the odds were at the beginning of the week. You got it early, you put your money down, that's the odds that you had, even if it changed before race time. So understanding that, in, in he, uh, you know, so he made his living, <laughs> that's how he made his living. Uh, and ultimately, um, he had one big day up in um, Sarasota. Um, and he went up to Sarasota and, Sarasota, not Sarasota, what's in New York, what's the racetrack? In, Saratoga, thank you very much. Went up to Saratoga and won uh, nine out of ten races that day and walked away with $350,000, which was a huge amount of money back in the 40s.
And so gave him a bankroll ultimately to you know, keep the, the, the team afloat and so on. So he winds up, he's got a force farm uh, in, in, in Maryland. He, he'd, he'd stopped down there, but his love was football and his love was his people. And he grew up on the North, 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 <laughs> North Shore. Um, and he always had a story, and he always had time, and he always had a cigar that he'd give you. We're shooting uh, the movie Fighting Back. Oh, I forget. To, they made a movie about my life called Fighting Back. Uh, DVDs will be on sale, you know, for, <laughs> can't find it, so like it's a hundred bucks. But anyway, no, no, <laughs> now it's okay. <laughs> no, so, but they were down, and, and so they went through the stadium, the, the shooting crew, and they told me this. And they went through, and they'd, they'd walk, and they, they'd walk with him as he was very proud of his stadium, Three River Stadiums they built. And every, and after Water Fountain, he'd stop and he'd just, you know, press the, press the button and make sure, and then he'd go around and they didn't, you know, he'd just, he'd just stop and he'd walk over and he'd press another one. And, you know, after they got done, they said, well, thanks very much for the tour and everything else. He said, well, I got one little question for you. You know, I just noticed <laughs> the fact that, you know, you press on all the buttons of all the water fountains in the stadium. Why? And his answer was, because it's my business. And that's the kind of guy he was take care of the little things. And the little things were people as well. And he took care of the people. There'd be a strike. And it'd be a, 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 a grounds crew strike. And this happened. It was a ground crew strike. You know, so they're out there striking. They got a picket line, Union Town, and be in Pittsburgh. And, and it was during the winter. Mr. Rooney was out there giving them or parkas, you know, because it was cold. And so he said, hey, you guys can't stop. And he'd bring coffee out to them, uh, even though the, they were picking uh, the, uh, the, the, the stadium. And that was the kind of guy, he, you know, he was. Just he had always something, took care of his people, took care of his, uh, um, his players, um, a lot of players uh, that nobody knows about, and just, you know, took care of them. So he was a, he was a great, Great owner to have. Oh, Dickie. Dickie hey, Dickie, yeah, yeah, Dickie sells liquor back in, uh, in, uh, in Wisconsin, lives in Oshkosh, yeah, so we still <laughs> stay in touch. <laughs> you stay in touch uh, I see him periodically, and not as much as uh, Marty Allen, uh, of, of course, uh, that you may know, and, and, and uh, uh, I don't know if you, you see the coach probably more often than I do, you get back there some, and so. Um, he's, uh, he's just getting old, you know, he's getting old, he had bad hips. I think he had a couple hip replacements, if I'm not mistaken, or knees or something. And so, but he's mentally sharp and he's got stories. So, you know. I have a friend that's a Raiders fan, and he would probably dispute the two string catch. Well, of course he would. Yeah. <laughs> what did I see? All right, I'll tell you what I saw. And here, here it was. I'm here. The play's down there. <laughs> okay, all right. Now, over the last 40 years, and I have to say this in all honesty, you know, probably, I don't know, there's about 360,000 people I've run into that actually saw this game and were there, <laughs> you know. Oh, I was there, I saw that game, you know, I was there. You know, I saw that took place, and so I'm here, it's down there. Okay, I have to tell you this. I don't know how you respond, but if you see an accident coming, you know, if you're sliding in the road, ice as it is during the winter time up here, and all of a sudden you lose control of your car and you're going towards either a telephone pole and or a tree, do you sit there with your eyes wide open watching you about to hit that obstacle? Or do you go, oh shit, I can't watch. <laughs> Come on, come on, let's be honest, okay? All right. So, here I was, down here, fourth down, balls up in the air, I go, oh, I can't watch. <laughs> <laughs> and I missed the whole thing. <laughs> so, oh, I can do it. it was a good catch. <laughs> I'm brainwashed. What non-stealer player do you expect to that's a good question. Non-stealer player. There was a lot that we played against. 
Robert Brazil, I played against Robert, he was an outside linebacker, I, you know, for his, uh, Roger Staubach, for the kind of quarterback that he was and his ability and as a two-minute quarterback and how he led the Dallas Cowboys. I mean, he was a, you know, wonderful, wonderful example, a wonderful player. So, you know, throughout the, throughout the league, you know, it was usually guys that you played against, you know, that, um, that you know, I respected for what they did. You know, even, even the Oakland Raiders, I mean, Kenny Staver in that whole, crew of guys. You know, when you play, oh, there's a certain, you know, there's a certain dislike, you know, that you have for that opponent because you're both are good teams. So the early part of the 70s, the Oakland Raiders, latter part of the 70s, the Houston Oilers for us were big rivalries. And so we'd go play, but then even play in the division. So you go up and play, you know, Cleveland and, and if you're playing up there, you never knew what was going to happen. You're playing Cincinnati, you never knew what was going to happen. Usually we could dominate those games at home, but not on the road as much. And sometimes we'd split those seasons, but you got to know the personnel because you played against them a couple times. You know, and I feel, I, I always feel this, that, that I never had the chance to play in a Pro Bowl, you know, or I never had a chance to play in a College Bowl. Because sometimes that's where those unions uh, cement themselves when you're playing with other guys from other teams and you just get to spend a week with them, you know, um, on the same team and then you play against them and, and, and there's a friendship that develops and I never experienced that. But guys like that, you know, Well, I would like to say I do, but I don't, <laughs> okay? Not because I wouldn't want to, but Terry's big, you know, he's big, he's huge, he's big, he's big, he's on television, you know? I was, he's on the Leno show, holy ripe sakes, you can't just go call him, you know? I mean, he's in movies and, you know, he does all that stuff and he lives on a ranch, you know? And then you gotta drive out to the ranch and, and you don't even know if he's there. So, not too often do I get to talk to him, okay? That's nice question though, but that's. Do you have a son or grandson that possesses the same skills you do? Because the Lions are looking for some help. <laughs> Well, let's start at the top. <laughs> Where do we start with that organization? You know? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> I'll recall. I'll tell them. I'll tell them the story. I'll tell them the story. Okay, fine. Play, running plays. Oh, that's right. They're about the same yard. You're right. Yards, yeah, it's, yep. Yards, yep. The same play on consecutive drives. Yep. 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 Oh, is that my question? Yeah. <laughs> I have to tell you this, sir, because it brings up Cleveland Browns, being the Cleveland Brown fans. You know, there's a and, and there. I mean, that's, that's been a great rivalry. I mean, just because of the proximity, you know, more than us in the, Cle in the, in the Philadelphia Eagles, you know, so it's there. And there's intermarriages that take place over the state line, and, you know, and everybody's got their colors and so on. And so you always think, well, you know, it's a hatred kind of a, a experience. And not in my case specifically, because of actually two plays, I mean two. Uh, you're talking about one, and I'll get to that one. The first play, though, the first play is that I have a soft spot in my heart because of uh, Joe Turkey Jones, okay, who uh, in, uh, <laughs> played defensive end for the Cleveland Browns. Now this was in 1976, and we're playing Cleveland up in Cleveland, and Turkey beats our offensive tackle and gets to the backfield, and he grabs Bradshaw. He grabs Bradshaw. And Bradshaw, and you have to understand, is that Bradshaw is a, is a fighter. I mean, he's going to run. He's going to try to do everything you can to get out of that tackle. Um, and, so, and so Turkey understands it. So he's got him like this, and he's going to put him to the ground. And he does, and he does, and he puts him up over his shoulders. He falls backwards, and then slams him head first into the turf, you know, and Boom, Bradshaw's there, flapping on the ground like a fish out of water, you know. You know holy cripe sakes. You know, so they get a, they get a um, stretcher and they come out and they take him off and they go in. Our backup quarterback 
is a rookie uh, by the name of Mike Krushek, who came out of Boston College. It's a rookie, the backup. That's all we had, Bradshaw and a rookie. So because Turkey Jones knocks Bradshaw out of the game, they got a rookie that comes in whose his best offense is <laughs> handing off the football. I get 1,000 yards <laughs> rushing. And I thank Turkey every time I get to see him. You know? So that was one. Now the second one, and the second one is that it becomes very embarrassing over the years that I've had the opportunity to interact. And usually during the years I was playing, it would, you know, be, you would be invited to do the sports banquets. So I think I ultimately did every junior high and high school football banquet uh, in Western Pennsylvania, you know, throughout that period of time. One of the questions that are, that are asked like this, it's usually from kids, you know, and kids always ask the questions everybody else wants to know, like, how much money are you making? <laughs> <laughs> what kind of car do you drive? How much can you lift? How many touchdowns did you score? What was your longest run that you've ever had? So you go, you know, and you just can't, it, it, what they want to know is like, well, let me see. I can bench press the stadium, oh, maybe three or four times. It's a little heavy, you know. And I, I don't have a car, I have a chauffeur. Oh, yeah, it's a big Bentley, you know. And, I mean, and I make, um, oh, probably about, oh, like $100 million a year, you know. And, and but when you go, my longest run was 19 yards. You know, it just kind of takes something out of that, you know, that whole story, you know. Because what they want to know, well, my longest run from the line of scrimmage actually was 233 yards because I ran down and I got all, and no one touched me, and so I ran back the opposite direction. And no one touched me in that way, and so until finally, so, so that's what they want to know. So now when you, so, so when you get 19 years, well, that went on and on and on, and then one, Sunday afternoon in Cleveland. The Browns took pity on the fact that my longest run was 19 yards. And they allowed me to break one up the middle for 70 yards, and I scored on that, on that, on that, on that play. So then thereafter, I could very proudly say, what was your longest run? 70 yards, <laughs> and I scored. <laughs> But, uh, but it was a game, but Franco, but Franco had a game, Franco, Franco, Franco broke one for 71 yards, uh, and uh, I had 70 yards, both of us had over 100 yards in, in that game, and we had another running back by the name of Sidney Thornton, uh, and Sidney uh, was a good guy, but Sidney broke one, 67 yards. <laughs> And he ran him down because <laughs> he ran out of gas. Uh, he ran out of gas at that time. But I just, I had adrenaline pumping up. I'm going, oh, man, I broke it through the, anyway, not that it was that fast. One last question, I guess, <laughs> Jim's standing. That's my cue. Oh, one last question. <laughs> yeah, what is it? My favorite Super Bowl, you know, each and I and I, I, I each Super Bowl had as, has a story, you know, each Super Bowl. So the first Super, so the first Super Bowl, you know, was the first one, and and what was special about the first Super Bowl was that I had a play specifically drawn up for me in that game, not for Franco, for me. Okay, and it was kind of and, and the play was called uh, Dive Thirty Four Sucker. And the reason it was a sucker play. So everybody in uh, everybody everybody went to the left. Everybody goes all the all the all the line pulls to the left. Franco comes underneath, pulls to the left because we're kind of a trapping, you know, a sweep kind of a team at that moment in time. I take a counter step and I come back. Alan Page, Notre Dame teammate of mine, played defensive end. One of the keys was this is that if our offensive tackle set up as a pass, he took an outside course. So he takes an outside course, everybody goes with the flow. There's this huge hole, I mean, that is left vacant. So we run that play like the third play, and phew, I come up, boom, up through that hole, gain 17 yards. Franco would have scored. 
Yeah, but I got 17 yards, which is fine. And I said, so we run that play, we run that play, and we run that play again. And it was because of a, 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 the, their defensive tackle was a guy by the name of Doug Sutherland, who was probably the best defensive lineman that they had, technique-wise, reading-wise, and so on. He wasn't the biggest or the strongest or the fastest, but he was the best technician. So when he read his keys, you know, he just, he, he, he followed and did what was supposed to be doing. So we come back and we run it again. And we run it again. And we run it again. And each time it was like 17, 12, you know, then it was 10, you know, now he's reacting. So it's in the fourth quarter. It's in the fourth quarter. It's a third and sixth situation. We're on the 20, their 20-yard 20 line. And we need to pick up a first down just to control the ball. So Bradshaw gets in the huddle, honest to God. And he goes, hey, what do you guys want to run? And honest to God, it was before I could even say anything, I could say anything, in unison, like everybody, go, sucker, we're on the sucker. And I'm thinking, oh yeah, because you don't do crap on that play, I mean, nobody blocks anybody, you know? And what do you think, you know, I, I, he's not that dumb, he's not gonna go for it the fifth time in a row, and fortunately, and he didn't, but he reacted, but I just made the six yards. Um, so that was my first play, my remembrance, and so we won it. We were very excited about it. The second one uh, it was against Dallas Cowboys. Now, the second one, just a uh, just move. The second one, the worst play ever in the history of the Super Bowls was called in that play. It was part of, I was involved in it. It was called. It was in the fourth quarter. We had the lead. Bradshaw had just thrown a touchdown pass to um, Lynn Swan, caught in the end of the end zone, give us a lead. In that play, he got knocked out of the game. Terry Hanready um, came in. So we, they got the ball back on the, on, 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 the, on the kickoff and came and we held them. We got the ball back. Now it's on, we're on the 42 yard line, our 42 yard line. It was fourth down and eight yards to go about a minute and 30 seconds left on the clock. You punt. I mean, it's all you, well, then all of a sudden, there's a timeout. Timeout. So we go, okay, Han Randy goes off to the sideline, he's talking with Chuck. They come back out on, on, on the field. And I'm thinking, okay, well, Fourth down and eight. What are you going to call? 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 Well, if it's a pass, you know, hopefully you go throw it up in the air. If they intercept it, it's like a punt, you know, you make the tackle, hopefully. Um, we get a first down. Usually it's just, you know, three things that happen. <laughs> There's only one that's good <laughs> in that one. Or if you're going to run the ball, Franco, I mean, he's our main runner. He's again. And so he comes back and on. And I said to Terry, I said, what is it? Full right split, that was a formation. 84 trap, I'm two. 84 trap, 84 trap, it's me. <laughs> Run into the strong side, off tackle trap. And if we break the huddle, he goes, oh, Chuck said, uh, run out as much time as you can. I'm not a run out guy, you know? <laughs> I'm an A to B guy, just A to B, that's it. Franco's a run out guy, I mean, you've seen him, he runs out, the, oh, he stutter steps and he comes back and not me. So the ball snap, boom, into my gut, boom, boom, two yards. <laughs> and the clock stops. And now they get the ball back. So they get the ball back on plus territory and you got Roger Staubach, the best two minute quarterback, ever in this game, and you got Drew Pearson, you got Preston Pearson as receivers coming up, and they just move the ball, boom, boom, boom. And I'm sitting outside, I'm thinking, oh, I'm gonna take the heat, because I didn't pick up the first down on this. And so they threw once too often in the end zone, we catch it the way I, anyway, so, we can, so that was the second, that's what I'm saying. Third one, because I caught a touchdown. Third one, I caught a touchdown right before the half. That score to give us a lead. And uh, I made the cover of Sports Illustrated because of it. So that's my favorite, actually, in all honesty. <laughs> uh, that's right. <laughs> anyway. 
Ale... What can you say after that? What a wonderful presentation. <laughs> Tell your <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Joe. On behalf of Jim.